Hello, here is a mini lecture about the genus of a knot. This is based on page 52 and onwards in our course notes. Uh, so here is the definition. It is that the genus of a knot, K, is called G of K, and it's defined to be the minimum of the genuses of the genera, which is the purple, which is the plural of genus. It's the minimum of the genera of the surfaces sigma, where sigma is a Seifert surface for K. So how do you compute the genus? Well, it sounds pretty bad. You've got to find all the Seifert surfaces for K and compute their genera, compute the genus of each one. Um, or you've got to find a Seifert surface with genus, uh, suppose you wanted to show that the genus was two, then you'd have to find a Seifert surface with genus two and you'd have to show that there weren't any with genus zero or one. Um, what does that tell you? That tells you that the genus is hard to compute. Um, so here's a fact. It says that if D is a diagram of K, then, well, Seifert's algorithm, remember, gives us a Seifert surface sigma D for our knot K. So for any diagram, we get a Seifert surface. Well, then sigma D is one of these Seifert surfaces we're taking the minimum of. And so the genus of the knot K is, well, it's the minimum of a set that contains the genus of sigma D. So we find that the genus of K is less than or equal to the genus of sigma D. Uh, this is a fact and a warning. What's the warning? Nothing else is true. It might happen that you made a terrible choice of diagram D and that consequently the genus of sigma D is 10 times the size of the genus of K. And then this inequality is strict and you learn you don't learn what the genus is. It can even happen that the genus of the knot K is strictly smaller than the genus of all the surfaces you get from the algorithm. There may be Seifert surfaces that don't come from Seifert's algorithm and the one with smallest genus might be of that kind. So there, nothing else is true. You can't, uh, what is my point? My point is that what you learn about the genus from Seifert's algorithm is an upper bound and nothing else. Well, sometimes you learn a little bit more. For example, uh, the genus of the unknot is zero. Why? Well, because the unknot obviously has, as one of its Seifert surfaces, the disk, right? Um, if you draw the unknot, then you can immediately draw the disk it bounds. So, well, the genus of the disk is zero. Uh, but the genus of any surface is always bigger than or equal to zero. So that tells us exactly that the minimum of the genera of the Seifert surfaces for the unknot is zero. So the genus of the unknot is zero. Okay, so here's a theorem. This theorem isn't proved in the course. It's uh, super, it's too difficult for us. Um, it says that the genus is zero if and only if k is equivalent to the unknot. So what this tells us is that the genus is an excellent invariant because it can tell the unknot apart from everything else. Uh, so that's good. So now this actually allows us to compute a few more genera. Here's an example. The genus of the trefoil, this trefoil, is one. Why? Well, let's take our diagram D, this one here. And let's apply Seifert's algorithm. So what do we do? We orient it. Then we smooth all the crossings uh, according to the orientation to get this thing. Then we count the number of Seifert cycles. Uh, in this particular fried egg, we get two. And we count the number of crossings in the original diagram. It's three. And so uh, our formula from the previous lecture tells us that the genus of the Seifert surface sigma d coming from this d is 1 minus s plus n over 2, which in this case is 1. So we learn that the genus of the trefoil is at most 1. But the trefoil is definitely not equivalent to the unknot. For example, we know this because uh, the determinant of the trefoil is 3, whereas the determinant of the unknot is 1. So they're not equivalent. So that means that the genus can't be zero, right? Our estimate here tells us, tells us the genus is zero or one. 
but it can't be zero because it's not the unknot. So the only possibility left is that the genus is one. Okay, now I'm gonna list you some theorems. Here's another hard one that's too tough for us. It says that the genus of a sum is the sum of the genera. If I take a sum of knots, work out the genus, that's the sum of the genera of the knots I started with. Here's another theorem which we can prove. The proof is in the notes. It says that if the genus is one, then our knot K is a prime knot. Remember, a prime knot is one that's not the unknot, and it's not the sum of two knots, which are themselves not the unknot. Okay, so if the genus is one, then K is prime. Uh, and that's not too hard to see. The proof's in the notes. You should definitely study it. Um, another theorem, every knot has a prime decomposition. In other words, if you take a knot K, then you can write it as a sum, something prime, summed with blah, 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 summed with something prime. And the final theorem in the notes is that there are infinitely many prime knots. In fact, the proof's there in the notes, and it shows that, uh, what it shows that is our, our knots that we're familiar with, 2n plus 2, 1, they look like the knots you get by having a series of n crossings in a, a series of two n crossings in a line, followed by this kind of handshake down the bottom. Uh, they prove that they all have genus one and that they are all distinct. So they're all prime and they're all distinct. So um, here's another sort of warning or piece of advice. You should go to your notes study these and learn them. These are important proofs. Okay, so that's the end of the mini lecture.